Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting for September 22nd, which also happens to be the first day of autumn, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere. So looking for some forward to some cooler temperatures. It'd be nice. I've got some good stuff to cover this week. We've got Spencer McIntyre here from the Dharma Initiative team is going to help take us through the framework bits, which is great. Let's hop on in. We'll hop into the framework portion of the meeting and I'll uh, virtually hand the mic over to Spencer McIntyre uh, to take us through. Spencer? Hello. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you, Pierce. Uh, so this week we have a bunch of new modules. Uh, first up is an exploit that is an arbitrary file write LPE on Mac OS, which was brought to us by a group of researchers imported over into Metasploit by Tim Wright, which, uh, and this vulnerability exploits CVE 2020-9839. Uh, uh, next up was a feature abuse in the DNS admin uh, server level plugin DLL feature uh, that was brought by Iman E. Uh, Jed Woodji and Shai Burr, and I believe we are going to have a demo of this uh, in a moment. Uh, we also got a Modbus banner grabbing uh, module by Ezekiel Fernandez and Juan Escobar. And then we also got a command injection vulnerability uh, by B. Coles L. Bay, which exploits uh, CVE 2020. Uh, 15920, which is a uh, command injection vulnerability within a PHP component of the Midas Solution uh, E framework. And uh, we also have a few more modules, uh, another one that uh, had quite a uh, splash um, that we're going to have a demo of was the Microsoft Exchange uh, RCE uh, by Stephen Seeley that was ported to Metasploit by our own William Vu. And that is an RCE in the ad tenant DLP policy uh, that exploits uh, CVE 2020-16875. So we're going to take a look at that one here uh, in a moment. Um, community contributor Hoodie brought us a F5 configuration importer. Uh, Hoodie was also busy with F5 devices and also brought us a general uh, device information gatherer module. Uh, so thanks to Hoodie for the, both of those uh, contributions. Uh, community uh, Tim Wright ported another vulnerability over to uh, Metasploit targeting Mac OS and the TCC framework. And I believe this vulnerability was originally identified uh, by Matt Shock L and that exploited uh, CVE 2020-9934. Uh, so a couple of good Mac OS uh, exploits uh, were added in this cycle. And finally, uh, Rabbit7's own Grant Wilcox added in a um, enumeration module to target Windows Hyper-V VM. So you can get some interesting information on uh, Hyper-V systems that'd be useful for uh, penetration testers. And uh, we also got some uh, enhancements. Uh, I myself added in authentication support for HTTP proxies uh, for uh, the Python Meterpreter implementation so you can authenticate to uh, your HTTP proxies. Uh, Rapid7's Christopher Greenlease added in an example of using the info index uh, to the search results. That way users are uh, more, more familiar with the different ways that they can utilize the results from the search. Uh, our own Alan David Foster also updated the search command to always show additional notes on how to interact with modules. Uh, William Vu, while actually working on the Microsoft Exchange RCE, made some much uh, needed improvements to the HTTP client library to make it a little bit more standards uh, compliant, specifically in regards to how it handles uh, redirects. So that was a, that was a great addition. And community uh, contributor uh, CN Cali team added support for notifications via Ding Talk to the existing sessions notifier plugin. Um, so I guess Ding Talk is a pretty popular service um, outside of the US. And so hopefully uh, users that are utilizing that can uh, take advantage of that to be notified when sessions are added to Metasploit. And uh, we also have a few bug fixes. Um, RTPT, uh, I believe this was a red team pen test team, Eric Geiser, uh, fixed a issue in SM the SMB version module to make it compatible with older versions of Ruby. 
Uh, I myself also added in architecture specific options for the cache payload size generations. So that way we can uh, keep the cache payload sizes properly working. And uh, community contributor uh, Egypt returned with a correct path calculation to the user's PowerShell profile uh, so that the immune PowerShell environment module works on newer versions of Windows. We also had a few more uh, additional bug fixes. Uh, our own Christophe de la Fuente uh, fixed uh, a data encoding issue with a report loot uh, method utilized by modules. Uh, Rapid7's own Adam Galway updated uh, some modules to utilize the newer services function instead of the uh, git service. And uh, another cont contribution from a community member, um, Lucas Vader, uh, fixed an issue where services-s was returning results from all workspaces rather than just the current workspace. So thank you to all the uh, community contributors that added in uh, wonderful bug fixes, enhancements, and uh, modules in this cycle. Um, as always, you can find uh, even more information on this in the weekly wrap-up posted to uh, the Rapid7 blog. And with that, that brings us over into uh, demo time. I'm going to be uh, demonstrating the Exchange uh, DLP RCE. Again, this was a vulnerability identified by uh, Stephen Seeley and brought into Metasploit by William Vu. And so let's, uh, let's go ahead and see this one. Uh, so this is an exchange, uh, excuse me, an uh, remote code execution vulnerability when within Exchange, whereby a PowerShell uh, can be injected into a commandlet that is not properly being sanitized. Uh, the catch is that the user uh, that is required to exploit this vulnerability, because this is an authenticated vulnerability, uh, needs to have the proper permissions in order to be able to uh, manipulate the DLP policy. So it's not just any Exchange user or anyone with uh, with an OA mailbox it needs to be someone with uh, with that permission. Uh, but our module is able to check to see that uh, OWA is running, and then after that, it is able to inject the malicious policy that actually executes the payload, as we can see over here in the back, at, or excuse me, rather towards the end. And uh, the result is code execution as NT authority system. So we can see that this was uh, going to utilize PowerShell to be able to deliver that payload for us. Okay, and then uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to a Christoph double feature who has two new modules that he is going to walk us through. All right, so um, this is actually for, uh, this is a demo for two modules. Uh, that process F5 big IP devices and configurations. So the first one is a past module. I'm going to stop the video here. So the first one is a past module to gather the information while on the device. And the, the other module is an auxiliary module to process configuration files offline. So they're both uh, very uh, similar. Um, we're, we're, the first module, sorry, uh, needs a session because it's a, it's a past module. <clears throat> so this is what we're doing right now. So we're using the SSH login module to connect to the uh, F5 big IP device using SSH and get uh, a session. Right, so let's check this. All right, so we have a session with root user in a slash config directory. All right, everything is okay. We're gonna set up our post module. So anum L5 module, right? And set the session. All right, so um, for those who are not familiar with the uh, F5, uh, F5 Big IP is a family of products that cover a software and hardware designed around application availability, access control, security solution, etc. 
So big IP software products are licensed models that run on top of F5 traffic management operation system, which is called TMOS. So this is what we have here because this module starts a TMOS session automatically to run specific command like this one, like show sys, show out. Um, those, com those commands uh, will return very interesting information and this model grab this information, store it in the loot. Um, so we have the, the path here and also store interesting information in the database. So we'll have credentials, uh, services, and uh, this kind of information stored in the database, right? Okay, so, um, here, the target, I uh, forgot to say, is version 15.1.0.4. Uh, and uh, so let's see, finish. So uh, yeah, this model will not only run common with TMOS, but also grab configuration file like this one or this one, uh, configbip.com for config IP underscore based on conf and parse them uh, the same way. So here we're checking the database. You can see that the host is populated. Services, credentials, we have master key, we have um, admin hashes, we have the SNMP uh, public community. Right, so now I'm gonna show you the same thing using the configuration file. So we're gonna clean up the database so host dash D will delete the host and delete all the related items we have in database. So the services, credit, et cetera. So everything is cleaned up and we're gonna use now the auxiliary module. All right, and we're gonna use, uh, we have to set a, uh, the path of the configuration file. So we're gonna reuse one of the five we stored previously, just for the demo. Um, we're gonna copy the path and use it here and check. So we're gonna run the module and check if the result uh, is the same. So, okay, so we, we, we need to set the uh, remote host also, it's just for the database. Uh, we, we can set it to anything we want, but it's uh, better to set it to the current host to have um, consistent information in the database. Here we go. So we have host, service, and credentials. Here we just have one credential, which is the um, um, community string for SNMP because we just uh, passed one configuration file and uh, the first module actually grabbed many uh, configuration files. So we have to use this module several times with each configuration file to get the same um, information. So that's it. Uh, Hi. All right, so I guess I need to uh, stop sharing where is. So that was, those are, are, were from Hoodie, I believe, and uh, just a, you know, another, a few more in the long series of modules he's, he's created uh, for configuration, importing, and gathering. Yes. I appreciate that. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, set of uh, models doing pretty much the same thing on different platform. And uh, that's uh, very worth to, to have a look at it. It's Great, great stuff. Yeah, yeah these right are on. some good ones. Um, obviously, F5 has been a, a hot topic recently uh, with some sure. of those, the phones that have shown up in the past few months. So thanks to Hoodie for those, definitely useful. All right. So um, this module is, um, this module checks if a host is running Hyper-V and it gathers information about all the installed VMs. So this is a very simple module, but very useful in, in pen test um, um, uh, configuration. 
So the uh, module output includes the name of the VM, status, CPU, usage, version of the Hyper-V engine, uh, and its state, like it can be running, um, um, suspended, offline, etc. So this is basically the output of the PowerShell command let get VM. So this command need some permission to run it. So you have to use a user that had this kind of permission. So we're gonna set a session first to get this module running. Here, we're gonna use a bind TCP metapreter payload. Uh, so the, the payload is already running on the host and we just set up the handler here to get the session. And we have session with the administrator user. Right, so we're gonna set up the enumeration, Hyper-V enumeration module. Set the options, so the session, and run it. Right, so this module will execute the get VM PowerShell command and return the exact same output here and store everything in a loot. So that's very cool module, very useful, easy to use. Thank you. I believe that that was uh, the module that uh, Grant had developed, correct? Yes, that's correct. Sorry, I, I forgot to mention. Awesome. Yeah, so that is a great segue over into our next demo, which is going to be by Grant. Yeah, so this module, um, just before you start the video, I'll just give a little bit of background on this. Um, but the, the module is a little bit unique in that it does require you to have some non-default setup. So to execute this module, you do need to be a user within the DNS admin group, and you must also have permissions to restart the DNS server. So the module's most useful in circumstances where you have both of these, but just keep in mind that they're not the default. So if you'll just start the video, so long. Um, so yeah, so the starting point that we have here is just, um, that we have a session already. Um, I'm just going ahead and showing that we've got the session and that it's currently running as a normal user. If we get the privileges that we have, we can see which is just the normal user privileges and I can't really get system either. We can also see that we're running on, well, Materpreter said it's Windows 2016 or later, um, but if we actually go into the information here. I'll just quickly show that it's actually, once I find the settings, which took me a little while, <laughs> um, it's actually running the Windows Server 2019. So we're just going to quickly go ahead and verify which version that is running. And you can see it's Windows Server 2019 standard, which is equivalent to Windows 10 1809. So we're just going to go back here. And we're going to go ahead and load up our module. So we'll search for DNS admin and then just use the use command to use that. And then we're just going to go ahead and set up the options here. Um, so this does also take an AV timeout option. Now, the reason for that is. Um, there is a potential issue where the module could end up dropping the file to disk and then this gets picked up by the AV. If that happens and we're in the process of starting to try to restart this, the DNS server, it can cause the DNS server to not restart. So the reason this option is added there is to prevent that timeout. You can also alternatively use a UNC server so you can um, specify uh, basically an SMB server as the DLL path and that will allow you to avoid this issue. 
So you can see we also have a check method to allow to for checking if the target's vulnerable. So I just ran that to check if the target's vulnerable. And we can see that it's vulnerable. Um, we're then going to write the DLL to disk, wait a couple seconds to make sure it wasn't caught by the AV, and then we should get a shell as uh, system. So if we double check this, we can see that on the same server, I've got one session as a normal user and one session as the system user. That's awesome. Thanks, Grant. Hey. That wasn't a question. <laughs> <laughs> Would this be primarily for persistence or for escalation? Um, Potentially, you could use it for persistence. Um, I think that would be the main use, given the permissions required, um, which are not default. But assuming that's, that is a scenario that does come up, it could be used for elevation as well. Yeah, it seems like it could be a little bit useful for each of them. Thank you, Grant. All right, uh, Brendan. Um, are you ready to demo uh, CVE 2020-9839? Yes, I am. Wonderful. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so uh, this is actually which. So I'm going to demo a pair of them, and I'm going to try and keep them straight. Um, so in this particular case, this is, I'm just going to get a uh, regular old uh, interpreter uh, session on an OSX uh, target. In this particular case, I'm just going through the, this process so anybody who wants to see it can see it. We'll go ahead and get the call back from the, uh, the Mac. So we've got our session. So in this case, we've got uh, Catalina version 10.15.4, which is relatively uh, recent. Um, the user in this case is just a regular old user. Background the session. What we're going to do now is we're going to use the exploit to get a root session. This is the uh, an arbitrary file overwrite bug in the CF uh, prefs D. So what this is, is there's a race condition that exists in that particular uh, service that allows you to do an arbitrary file write and anywhere on the system. And because this is a Nix based system, an arbitrary file write to any location is a real bad thing since everything is done by config files. In this case, uh, we're gonna overwrite the uh, the PAMD login file and basically temporarily say that the root uh, account doesn't need a password. And then we're going to log in and clean up that. So in this case, we've gone ahead, we've done the overwrite. You can see that PAMD uh, D login is uh, overwritten. Uh, and we go ahead and set the user, execute our new session, uh, re restore the uh, old login file. And you can see we're now root. This was the one of the additions from Pwn to Own, correct? That got yes. talked about again at DEF CON, I believe? Uh, yes. The actual question I was getting at is, this is a chain, isn't it? There's, there's a Safari bug that um, at Pwn to Own was chained with it? Yes, I, I believe so. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, in fact, it's, there's a, if you go to the uh, PR for this, uh, which is 13992, there's a link to that uh, for the Pwn to Own 2020. Oh, nice. And, okay. But the the link yeah. is there if you if anybody wants to follow it and check it out. Yeah, that was pretty neat research. Um, thanks to to Tim for his work on this. And I'm looking at the PR, and he he said he was going to work on a Safari exploit next. So, Tim, it, hats off to you, and you're on the hook, man. We appreciate so, uh, you. I believe that Safari exploit is already out. The catch is, is that that Safari exploit is more limited than this particular privilege escalation. Gotcha. Um, 
And so I think that the, we split these up so that they get broader coverage. Nice. Thanks, Brendan. No worries. Thank you. And so this next one is uh, a bypass for some permissions that are on uh, Mac OS X. So there's something called the Transparency Consent and Control Framework. Uh, in this particular case, what that does is it limits access to certain things that are deemed you know, non-essential from different processes. And I really like this book because it's a lot of fun, um, simply because it's, it's one of those things that the, the error comes from where you didn't expect it to. So uh, by all means, uh, go ahead and start up. The, the transparency consent and control framework is run by a service. It has a database that controls its behavior. That database is protected from overwriting uh, by uh, the SIP uh, protections that exist on Mac OS. But technically, the database is still owned by the user, even though the user can't necessarily change it. The catch exists in that because it's owned by the user, it relies upon the environment variables of the user. So this exploit works by changing the environment variable home to a place that a user can write to, duplicating the database, overwriting what needs to be overwritten, and then relaunching uh, that uh, TCC uh, service. You can see we get a, a Mac OS uh, session. I've tried to look at the documents folder, which is one of these protected folders. In this case, we'll use the exploit. Uh, actually, it's not an exploit and I always get that wrong. So I apologize, I'll back up this in a minute. It's a post because we don't get a new session. It's a relatively straightforward module. We just set the session. There's really nothing else. And so you can see we're creating a temporary directory. We're uh, copying over the TCC database that we've changed. Uh, we've set uh, the home variable. You can see that there's a line here that says to clean it up unset that home variable um, and restart the service. Now, when we go back in and we do uh, analysis of documents, we can see what's in the documents folder. I was gonna say this was Matt Shockley uh, and he has an absolutely awesome Medium post about this. So if you wanted to get in any more information, I'd, I'd say go there. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really fun, fun demo to watch. Uh, yeah, Apple goes to a lot of trouble to lock that stuff down. Pretty cool to see it uh, do the thing in place, so a little bit more stealthy like that. I think that's the last of the framework demos. So uh, Pierce, I can pass it back to you for attacker KB updates. Cool. Thank you, Spencer, and thanks everybody for the for the demos. Those are great. Uh, always always enjoy watching those. Uh, so let's talk about Attacker KB, the attacker knowledge base, uh, where you can learn about and discuss which ones matter and why. Just visit attackerkb.com, like it says in the slide there. Uh, the team has been working on a number of items, um, and uh, we've got a few few to demo today, show you some progress. We'll start out with uh, some site-wide announcements, uh, demo from Aaron. Okay, so this should be a pretty quick demo. Um, I'm demoing this locally right now. I believe the feature is ready for production. We just don't have any announcements in production to demo. Uh, so you can see up at the top here, we have two announcements. Uh, these are obviously just samples. Uh, they appear site-wide, and this would be something that our team uses just to convey any important information, maybe new features about the site or any like events might be going on uh, to our users. Um, they appear on every page um, like this. You can dismiss them by clicking on the X. They'll fade away by navigate to another page. It remembers your setting. It stores that in a cookie. Um, dismiss all of them. Uh, they look okay on mobile. Here's evidence of that. Uh, and that's really all there is to it. So you may be seeing announcements uh, coming to an AKB near you very soon.
uh, we will roll into a demo on um, the Rapid7 analysis creation notification. Uh, Matthew's going to walk us through that one. So I'm demoing this locally so that we don't uh, send all of our uh, production clients uh, false Rapid7 analysis uh, create notification. Um, however, this feature has been deployed, was deployed uh, last week, a week ago, on the 15th. So when Rapid7 analysis are created in production, all of our users will receive a uh, notification of that, both in-app and via email. So locally, I just have created this silly little future vuln wow um, to demonstrate that. I'll do a quick dip into my profile and show you the setting. So this is the new setting that was added. Rapid7 analysis created. You can control the email and in-app notification of that uh, under your user account if you were didn't want to receive uh, either of those. However, I hope that you keep those enabled. They do come enabled by default. And I'm going to bounce back to the main screen while in another browser, a Rapid7 admin is secretly, maybe not secretly, but adding a Rapid7 analysis for that particular topic. If I refresh the homepage, I would see a notification that lets me know that the Rapid7 analysis was added for that uh, future goal now. And if I click that notification, it will take me back to the Rapid7 analysis so I can see that new analysis that was added. Uh, I would also get an email because I have that feature on. Uh, it would contain a link that would take me to this uh, Rapid7 analysis as well. So this is a way that our users can be aware of new Rapid7 analysis being added for uh, topics in our system, which is great. Because I, th I think a lot of times you'd be looking through the system, you'd have to dive down into each topic and check if there was a Rapid7 analysis. So and uh, stay up to date and know when Rapid7 is posting new technical analysis and jump on, you know, read our analysis and then submit your own rating analysis if you haven't done so already. That's super cool. Um, if I'm signed up to receive or if I have the, the setting enabled to receive uh, notifications on Rapid7 analysis, do I also get a notification um, if an analysis is updated? So we have that feature implemented, but not exposed right now um, gotcha. for, two, for two reasons. So it's coming soon. Uh, it's largely the decision not to, to release it right away because we don't have uh, uh, a means of showing the difference. So when there are changes, it might not be clear what the change was. Uh, gotcha. So once we get that feature implemented, we'll be flipping the update on and you'll see uh, edits as well. Cool. Thanks, Matthew. Absolutely. Yeah, this is nice. It provides the particular the email functionality allows people to kind of asynchronously get notified of when Rapid7 posts an analysis uh, and then they can come just click the link and, and read it directly. That's, that's cool. So James is going to demo the MITRE ATTACK TAGS. Um, I'm actually demoing this on behalf of Louie. He is the one who did, uh, it was actually a joint effort. There was uh, quite a few people that worked on this one. Um, but uh, Louie's out today, so um, I'm taking this opportunity to troll him. Um, is this, uh, you can see the attacker KB window? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, this is a this is on prod this is live um it's been live for since last week um what so this is a new category of tags that we've added to um start highlighting the miter attack techniques that are uh, i'm not sure if uh, people are familiar with it but just like a brief background miter um released this set of tactics and techniques that's kind of a way to categorize vulnerabilities um they, they get pretty granular uh, and uh, based on whatever the type of tactic or technique is, um, the vulnerability is categorized under, they provide like some general things you can do to help mitigate against them. Um, 
So one of the things that we want to do with Tech KB is try to use uh, the community to help uh, assign this data to vulnerabilities. Um, there's really not a good place out there right now that has a good listing of like the CVE is classified under this tactic or technique. So um, we're going to try and use uh, the uh, the attacker KB community plus some machine learning to try to um, start getting this data available for people. So it's, it's, it's kind of a big deal because nobody's really doing this yet. Um, and if they are, it's, it's really limited in data. So um, hopefully we can utilize, uh, you know, the manpower of people all across the world to, to help start getting this data available for people to consume. But um, the UI for it's pretty simple. It's still kind of in flux, but this is the way it's going to look for now. And then uh, we might make some tweaks to it based on feedback. But uh, you come to any vulnerability as, as a logged in user and you can click this little plus right here. Um, it's going to pop up this modal. Uh, this a listing on the side is all of the tactics. And then within each tactic, there is a bunch of techniques that can be uh, assigned. You can select any number of these. Um, so, you know, the tactics range from, uh, you know, a lot of high level stuff. Um, and then the techniques get, get pretty granular. This is like, you know, spear fishing via service. And, um, it, it, you know, there's a lot of them. I think there's 500 and something. So, um, but they're all classified underneath a, ta a tactic. So you'll get a different uh, set of tags based on which tactic you have selected. Some of them are like duplicated amongst other tactics, but they, based on the way Miter like provides their uh, remediation and, and defense um, recommendations, you know, it, it's going to be different depending on which tactic it lives under. Um, but anyway, so let's just say this is initial access with valid domain accounts and trusted relationship. So you just hit submit. Um, and it'll refresh the page and now these will show up. Uh, you'll notice this, this uh, validation section right here. This is uh, kind of a little ahead of ourselves, but um, what the plan is is for, uh, we, we're working with another team within Rapid7 that's going to be adding a machine learning tool that uh, is going to add suggestions for MITRE tags based on what like the text within the CVE. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you're just a user coming to the site, you may not have an idea of which MITRE tags actually apply but you see the suggestion, you can then validate if that's actually, you know, yes, this actually applies and that'll help train the tool to uh, provide better recommendations in the future. So um, it, it, it's still a little ways out, but the, the goal is that, uh, you know, you'll see recommendations here and then you'll be able, a human will be able to validate them and say that this is actually, this does correctly apply or they can, you know, say, I actually know this doesn't apply and then select, um, the the actual tags that they want but that's still a little ways out we're kind of just doing this in iterative approach um i will show if you add a t something from a different tactic um it'll show up in a different category so yeah as more tactics get added they'll they'll just keep adding on um but yeah that's pretty much it uh it's a pretty cool feature and it's really uh you know it's going to be really valuable as more people start adding data for it Excellent.